Hi guys, I'm Shmi. Hello and welcome back to the channel where today I must confess I'm a little bit unprepared because I've just been throwing the keys to this, the new Nissan Z or Z perhaps I should say as a Brit. Now I'm out here in California, we're in Los Angeles and I figured we'd come and find a nice tight twisty road to drive the car on except it's boiling hot so I am cowering in the shade. Bear with me on that. Now we don't actually get these in the UK but they've only just launched out here and in fact this particular car in the regular sport trim is chassis number 10. Yes, chassis number 10 Nissan Z, the 400 horsepower car that you get for $40,000. 400 horsepower for $40,000 in this thing, along with a host of tech, a lot to discover. This also has a manual transmission, and I figure we're on the right kind of roads to enjoy it. So let's have a quick little intro to the car, some first thoughts and feedback, just jumping into it for a test drive and what it feels like from my perspective. And then, yeah, let's push it a little bit harder, and see what it's all about, the new Nissan Z. Let's have a very quick look at this then. The car in quite a subtle spec in the grey paintwork here, but as I said, a super early build, but a car that I have kindly been lent by Sean from Purist, who has let me take the keys today, thanks to the team out here with Nissan in the US, to drive this thing on the roads right here, surrounded by sunshine and rolling hills, exactly where you want to be with something like this. A 400 horsepower manual rear driven sports car, a car with some retro throwback design features and details like the tail lights, for example, plenty of things that link to previous Nissan models, the Datsun styled Z logo that you have worn there on the C pillars, similarly around the front with the grill, with the headlights and with plenty more elements, these lines and shapes that you have over the top of the bonnet and talking bonnet, we'll take a look at the engine that lies underneath. But the seventh generation of this. The previous, the 370Z, lasted for quite some time, it has to be said, over a decade I think in total, but this is now a new era and a new car also means a new engine. So to open this up we have the 3 litre twin turbocharged V6, 400 horsepower out of this thing. You can have it with the 9 speed auto gearbox or with the 6 speed manual tucked in under the brace across the top there, looking pretty good, quite mounted, well quite far back in the engine bay, no hydraulics or support for the bonnet. You need to pop the rod in place for that. But a car that I think has some charm through the look of it, through the fact that it is quite edgy. You know, the lines are quite sharp, quite unusual in this modern era. If we go and have a look inside, we'll talk a lot more about this while driving, but inside here, we've got these sports seats. We've obviously got our six speed manual shifter. We've got a clutch pedal lurking just down there. We've got the infotainment with Android Auto, Apple CarPlay, all of those kind of things. You've got the gauges up on the dash, which are pretty cool as well. There's a lot to it that I think is, you know, very nice and usable, very dailyable. That's a big part of what this is about. If we pop open the trunk, the boot, press down there, lift the hatch up back here, decent amount of space. Again, you've got that support brace that runs across the back. Not the deepest, a fairly shallow boot, in fact, but enough to store some stuff away in there if you need with a car coming. So I need to shut the door to make sure I'm out of the way. But yeah, this is the car that there's been a lot of hype around recently, a huge amount of hype in fact, which is why when I have the opportunity right now to spend just a few minutes with it, I figured I had to take this out for a drive. So let me go and get it started, get ready to go on out and have some fun. Come and take a seat inside here with me and you'll notice just quickly that line, that's quite nice. Contrasts more obviously against different colored exteriors, but we'll run through this and get it started in just a second. So foot on brake and clutch, start button just here in the center rumbles into action. We've got that digital display with the animated graphics there. We've got the Android Auto and CarPlay in the center. We've got our shifter currently in first because we're parked on a hill. We've got reverse to the bottom right. You would have on the performance spec buttons for other controls like adjusting your modes and also for your rev matching. This being the entry price point sport spec means unfortunately we don't get those, but you do get a pretty nice level of tech in here regardless. I mean, to have the controls that you do have to go through different settings and whatever you might like to see through the screen up in front of you. And obviously in here to have everything accessible as well. Info, a whole series of settings and things you can go through on the touch screen. We'll take that back to home. But I think it's all about the driving. I think it's all about what this is like. So let's go, let's go drive and let's go see what the new Z is like on the road. Into gear then. And one of the first things I'm gonna say is that the clutch takes some getting used to. We've got a hill hold just to make pulling away super, super, super easy. But the clutch has a very high bite point, then quite a small amount of travel. 
and it's quite a snappy little thing to get familiar with at first, but as soon as you're on the move, it feels tiny, agile, nimble, exactly what something like this should be. But the crazy thing, and I'm sorry to keep repeating it, is that this car in the sport trim level is $39,990. It is less than 100 bucks a horsepower, 400 horsepower in a tiny little thing. And obviously these kind of roads are the perfect place to enjoy it. Flipping the shifts myself. Now in this car, we don't have the sports exhaust. That is standard on the nine speed automatic transmission car. But just to take it easy going up here, it's where this package, to be honest, I can't quite get around how they can offer it at the price point they can with all of this going on inside. And I suppose this has arguably been the thing with Japanese cars for a long time. You get a lot of tech for a lot, well, very little money. That's the point, right? Now, not a whole lot is taken from the previous 370Z. Um, the car has had effectively a completely new bit of life put into it. It's starting from a brand new place but you're not feeling that it's short on power. We've got 350 pounds foot of torque as well to go with that. And it's very, very torquey. And just, I don't know, going uphill here feels really quite impressive, especially for the money as we go over the crest at the top of this hill. I'm quite taken back by this. I think these are the perfect kind of roads to show off something like this. You want to be on tight and twisty tarmac to get the most out of it. Now, the 18-inch wheels are standard. If you have the performance specification, you get 19-inch wheels along with the variable different driving modes and a few other technical elements to it as well. But down here, it just glides down. And I'm not trying to race down the road. I'm trying to just enjoy it, I'm trying to drive as you might on your first experience in something like this. Revs up to 7,000 RPM. We're not going to get anywhere near that heading down the hill but blipping the shifts down. It's easy to find the next gear on the H pattern. It knows what it's doing. It knows where it's going. Brakes, obviously decent. It's a pretty small light car, so nothing too dramatic needed on that front. Open up the power. You get plenty of response out of it straight away. I know we're heading down and obviously gravity helps in that type of scenario, but that is a lot of power. Very, very easily obtained. And that's probably what's so impressive about this. It'll be more fun coming back up though. So let me get down to the bottom of the pass and turn around. Something that's a very pleasant surprise about this car is the turning circle. It can turn in the most extraordinarily tight diameter of space. Full lock. I mean, you could just flick it around and then obviously it would be even easier. But like that, super, super, super easy. So let's head back up the hill then stretch this out a little bit more and enjoy this drive. But this is, I guess, the point of it, right? If you don't want to be going hardcore and you just want to be chilling in the car, it's actually pretty forgiving in that respect. I do think you'd need to take a little bit of getting used to the clutch and shifting. Like I say, it is fairly twitchy in comparison with other sports cars, but obviously there's also that automatic gearbox option, even if nine speeds might be a little bit overkill. You're not going to be really blipping up and down manually through nine gears with 400 horsepower. Otherwise, you will be forever pressing shift paddles on the back. Now, both the manual and the auto have launch control, so you can launch this about four seconds to 60 miles an hour, which is also quite impressive if you think about it. Obviously, the traction coming through those rear wheels, enjoying blipping it down, throwing it in through some corners, and it does communicate well. The steering is very light, very, very, very light. Back wants to play around even with traction on. Haven't disabled anything, but I think it would have no problems with that amount of power, letting the back just wiggle around, play around, be connected and entertained by it. And this is one of the funny things, these kind of roads where they meander back and forth in Europe, you'd be allowed to cross over the middle line and enjoy straightening out your line up the hill, but here the solid double yellow line means no sorry. Clearly people have been having fun on these roads though. It does do that, that beeping when you touch or go near to the line on either side, which kind of annoys me, but I'm sure you can disable that 
if you don't want it to do it. Obviously the lanes here are quite narrow. But there's quite a decent soundtrack and I'm just in the mid-range of the revs at the moment. We're not going to get up to the red line on these kind of turns. What a lovely thing. Now, the seats, perhaps they aren't the best in the world. Steering wheel feels good though. Buttons are fairly plasticky, but obviously you've got lots of control over your infotainment, which is all quite nice. And this is again the thing, while it's not perfect, it's very, very good for the money. It's very good for the money. And that's something I find a little bit crazy, you know. A European competitor would probably be $50,000 worth. An extra 25% over this. And what would it really offer you on top as I'm concentrating a little bit? Go around the rocks. We've got that wine coming as well. <laughs> it does want to dance around. Now these roads are a little bit dusty, I'm not going to lie. I'm surprised by how quickly it wants the back end to just move around, but I guess there's no weight back there, no seats, very little behind you as the occupants of the vehicle. Good times to be honest, very, very, very good times. I was slightly wrong there. It is four and a half seconds to 60, but that is still remarkably competent. And again, this is up against the cars like the Supra and the Audi TT. Cars that were typically the class above where the 370Z would have sat. Now, if you go for the performance spec, that's where you'll get a nicer interior trim, you'll get the better sport suspension, you'll get those 19 inch wheels with summer tires and a host of upgrades, which is probably where I would choose to put my money. But when you think about the styling of it, you know, these retro throwbacks that you get with the design that link to the 240Z to the 300ZX, and I'm getting very confused myself about saying Z or Z, but we'll roll with it for the time being, bear with me on that one. I just think that that's where it's fun, it's different, right? That's what you need, and that's what I think makes cars like the little Honda E stand out, because it's so different. That's what makes so many newer cars that are arriving on the scene link back to emotional connections that make you desire it for something more than the, let's say, outright figures and what your head might say, what the heart says is becoming so important as all of these cars are very, very capable. Now, as we go down here, it does waft a little bit. It does move around a little bit and perhaps a slightly firmer setup and the adaptive setup would be, I think, the option to go for really with it. But as the manual gearbox goes, in terms of the gearbox alone, it's really good. It's actually quite fun. The more I'm getting used to it, it did take me a moment just to adapt to the feel of this specific box, but it works well. It's a short throw. It's very easy, I suppose. You know, sometimes you get cars that are just easier to slot from one gear to the next than others. This does the job really well, and I think would handle commuting or daily driving tasks in a pretty nice way as well, which obviously gives you another character out of it. So as, I suppose, entry fun sports cars go, this has brought a lot of punch to the playing field. You know, in the world with 124 Spiders and MX-5s and these kind of things. This brings you 400 horsepower into that. Yeah, it's heavier than the outgoing car. It's obviously updated. It's got a whole lot more safety stuff and a whole lot more technology at play. But it also gives you a whole lot of fun for the money, a whole lot of fun. And that, to me, is very important. Parked back up, I do want to show you a few more things around the interior of this car. One thing I'm going to mention is the roof line here, like I experienced on my GR Supra, is so low that you do have to dip your head under it or you'll find yourself hitting your head on that every time you step in and out of the car, which is quite a funny, amusing little thing. Now, in terms of the dashboard, obviously you've got the large rev counter and your speedometer on the opposite side. You can go through a few screens. There's not a whole lot of information you can show through here. Your tire pressures, your media information, your uh, cruise control and other settings and things. Just a few fairly basic bits of technology, but obviously always nice to see. And then with these controls for your music and also for your voice interaction and your adaptive cruise control over on that side as well. And this heritage style Z logo that carries through your turbo pressure and 
battery status gauges are just always a fun kind of thing, right? On Japanese cars, good to always see those. Air conditioning's doing a nice job, small cabin, so pretty easy on that front. The screen, you notice, is actually really quite raked. It really points upwards, which I suppose helps with reflections, especially with the large window that you have behind you. Uh, physical volume knob is always something I'm a big fan of. I hate it when you have to go through menus and touch things to turn down the music. You always wanna be able to do that with a hotkey, so that works nicely. You've also got your daylight settings as well, if you want a one key, just to make that a touch darker. Back to home, this is where you've got these tiles that you can see, these main tile screens where you can shuffle it around and change a few things, or you can go into the specific settings modes and configure up all of that stuff. And obviously you'd have the driving settings uh, in the performance variant. You've got a little storage cubby down here, some USB ports, your automatic air conditioning. Um, it's kind of a cross between auto and manual air conditioning because you do have manual toggles and dials, but you can actually swing them all to the auto setting, which obviously right now, given it's quite warm, is going to blow air pretty aggressively. Your shifter, this short throw shifter, it's a nice feel, it's a nice thing. You got a typical uh, H pattern, press it in and over there to go into reverse. You've got the reversing camera then that pops up as well, but otherwise does what it says on the tin. You've got an electronic release for the rear boot. You've got a cup holder here, your parking brake as well, and then a small little armrest cubby in there with your 12 volt and another cup holder that cup holder is kind of unusual given that it's tucked under this so it's not hugely functional I have to say behind us there's a little bit of storage actually on the shelves right behind you so a little bit of storage for some small bags right there just behind you cup holder again or bottle holder in your door pocket and then over here is where we've got the auto windows this car has manual seats so we've got the manual seat adjustment here and for the backrest and the slider underneath at the front, as opposed to the automatic seats, which you'd get again in the performance car. The visors are kind of unusual because they've got these bits that slide out, which I presume is if you have them around there, you can slide that out for more coverage, which is, hey, does the job. Or can you do that? Yeah, that's instead of them. They don't pull from that end. Anyway, we'll put those away for the moment. Um, door lights. And I think that's pretty much it. We've got glove box over here. Only a tiny bit of storage actually in there. Not hugely functional. We've got the six speaker sound system. Um, but otherwise, you know, it's quite a nice interior. Not the finest of materials. It's pretty plasticky, I'm not gonna lie. Everything that you look at and touch in here, you'd get the suede on the performance seats as opposed to the base cloth that we have on here. And I also noticed that when you lean back on the headrest, the arms that go down kind of press out on here which is kind of weird as well. I'm not gonna lie, a very odd thing about this. But all in all, it's quite a well-equipped cabin. It's quite a nice overall thing, to be honest. I'm normally a fan of cars in brighter colors. This is the gun metallic with the graphite interior. Obviously, I mentioned a bit these retro-styled tail lights, this shape, obviously they're new technology, as opposed to what you would have found 20 or 30 years ago. But the styling is just quite cool. And the same actually goes for the exhaust tailpipes down here and the way they're finished with that kind of rough look around the outside of them. It's quite a cool thing. You've got the shape you'd expect, you know, that coupe roof line having started from the fairly long bonnet that you have up front, obviously housing the engine up there. But everything, I suppose, as you would expect it to be for a car like this, the links to the 240 again with the eyebrows and the headlights, this style for the grille, the quite aggressive lower splitter that you have and this undercut that you get down with very straight edges, very straight lines everywhere, especially up over the bonnet as well. And just everything, giving it that retro look, giving it that retro styling. But this is the Nissan Z. It is not the 400Z or whatever they might have chose to call it next. It is just the Z in Japan. It's the Fair Lady Z, but it's a car that's got so much history and it's so iconic that a Z is all you need. You know what it is from a single letter. So that's the power of marketing and the power of branding, hey? They've done a pretty good job with it. And they've done a pretty good job with this car. It has to be said, overall, very impressed. There are things that could be better about it. But what they do give you for the money that you pay is what's really stood out to me with it because yeah i mean at that price point having had my supra which as i said would be about ten thousand dollars or something more like for like this has 60 horsepower more arguably the supra has more power than claimed but a bit more power and i would say a bit more excitement out of it as well a bit more excitement for me from this Maybe I just like the V6 as opposed to the straight six. Who knows? Today though, it is a big thanks to Sean and Purist, and of course to the guys, look, perfect competitor, little Honda S2000. 
Japanese sports cars, hey, they're what we love. So big thanks to Sean at Puris and a big thanks as well to the team at Nissan USA for the opportunity to drive this today, even if it was only for a couple of minutes. It's been a quick one. I need to go and give the keys back now onwards to the next adventures. But thank you very much for watching, guys. I hope you've enjoyed coming along for my first experience at the wheel of the Nissan Z regular spec, sports spec, out here in Los Angeles, California. That's it for now, though. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again very soon. Cheers.